Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Welcome to today's webinar, The Future of HR, How Predictive Analytics is Changing the Game in 2018. Brought to you today by Outmatch, the leaders in transforming the world of work. My name is Jason Ferrara. I'm not Charles Summers, who you see here on the screen. Charles has an appointment with the flu today, so I'm filling in for him. Uh, but it's my pleasure to be the moderator here for the webinar. If you want to get in touch about future webinar topics, a couple of housekeeping items here, um, or specifically anything about Outmatch, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly. That's jferrara at outmatch.com. Or as you see Charles's email address here, csummers at outmatch.com, feel free to reach out to him. Obviously, during the webinar, you can ask questions using the chat uh, functionality on the, on the webinar interface, so feel free to please do that. So maybe before we get started, it would be great if you could jump out to Twitter. If you're not already following Outmatch on Twitter, um, follow us at OutmatchHCM. It's also a place where you can tweet questions or thoughts or quotes from the webinar that you want to mark or remember or share. Um, today's presentation is going to take about 45 minutes. Um, and following that, we've set aside some time for Q&A. So for sure, ask questions if you, if you so desire. You can always follow up afterward, and we'll be happy to answer questions there. Um, so like I said, in the chat window on the side of the GoToWebinar status window, you'll see where you can ask questions in, in the chat feature during the Q&A session. Um, and also, like I mentioned, Twitter is, is also acceptable. So those are our housekeeping items. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is exciting for us uh, at Outmatch, you know, being at the forefront of predictive analytics used for uh, human capital uh, is really a great place to be right now. You know, we've recently launched a new platform. We've launched a new website along with that platform. So we'd love for you to go uh, check out the site and, uh, you know, understand a little bit more about who we are and, and what we do. So we'd love to have you there. If you haven't seen that yet, that's Outmatch.com. Uh, so because you're attending the webinar too, you know, I know that you know predictive analytics is really gaining momentum in the business world. Certainly it's a topic that's trending and it's beginning to really trend for HR. Obviously other teams within a company are using predictive analytics. HR is really getting to the point where this is a must have for people's businesses. Um, so another reason why it's so important to think about big data and analytics and predictive analytics, especially as you kick off the year, how you can really integrate that into your, into your business. And, you know, what makes predictive analytics so significant uh, is one of the things we're going to talk about in today's webinar. Why now is the time to begin to build up your understanding of predictive analytics, your ability to gather analytics within your company, uh, specifically for the use of HR. So we'll cover those, those things today on the webinar. So that's enough of me talking. We're now going to turn to our presenter, Greg Moran. He's the CEO, president and CEO of Outmatch. He is a founder of several HR tech companies, so he's been in this space for, for some time and really understands the issues um, and how analytics would really apply to the human capital space. He's also the co-author of a new ebook called The Essential Guide to Predictive Talent Analytics, we're thrilled to uh, have him here presenting for us today. So, Greg, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jason. And uh, to Charles, who was supposed to be our moderator today. I hope he's uh, feeling better. But Jason and I are glad to be not locked in a room with a guy with the flu this afternoon. So, um, right. thanks to uh, thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us today. It's uh, really really happy to have you all spending a little bit of time with us uh, this afternoon or this morning or wherever uh, wherever you happen to be. Um, tells you an awful lot about the topic of, uh, of predictive analytics. As we sit here today, we, we kind of, you know, we held off on starting um, uh, for a couple of minutes. And the reason we did that is because um, we, we probably have about three to, we always, we're always very fortunate when we do these webinars at Outmatch. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of people who, who attend. And uh, we do this one around predictive analytics, and we have <clears throat> three times the amount of people um, who have registered. So there's literally people from all over the world uh, joining us uh, this afternoon, and we really appreciate that. But it, while we'd love to take credit for that, uh, 
you know, being outmatched. Um, it, it's it's really the topic, right? That uh, that everybody um, is uh, is here for, and and because predictive analytics is a big thing, and and particularly, you know, most of you, if not everybody on this call, is um, is in the talent world in in some form, whether that's HR, talent acquisition, or talent management, or whatever it is. It's a big topic. Um, and that's because it's really analytics are really fundamentally fundamentally changing the way that businesses operate. And we know that organizations of all kinds are really finding really new and innovative ways to use predictive analytics, and it's sharpening their decision making capabilities to really give them a stronger competitive advantage than they've ever had before. And companies who are doing this in a smart way, and we're going to talk about some of those companies um, today, and we're also going to talk about how you can start to apply this to your organization. But before we go on, let, let's take a look at some of the impressive ways that businesses are really using predictive analytics. Uh, and, and before we do that, I think one of the things we want to do is really define what is predictive analytics, because we hear this, these words all over the place, right? And, and, um, and it can be very buzzwordy, um, we know, and we, we, we talk about analytics, but, you know, what is the, what is real? What, what does that really mean when you start to apply it? And you know, I guess the definition here is that predictive analytics is really the practice of analyzing both current and historical data together to really make predictions about future events. And it's that last piece that's really the important part. It's that prediction about future events that's really the important thing here, as opposed to the basic reporting, which I think often analytics really gets. Uh, confused with. So on the surface, um, this may not sound really cutting edge, right? We'd love to have a more, you know, fancy sounding definition, but it's really, it's predicting trends and future events has always been the holy grail of business success. The more that a business can really predict what's going to happen in the future, the more that they can plan for those events to capitalize on those events. Predict the future and you'll know what products will be in the highest demand. You'll know what solutions will be the most successful for your clients. And you'll know when you're going to experience shortages or surpluses. And then you'll know which opportunities to pursue and the risks that you really want to avoid. Traditionally, businesses have looked at data and outcomes from the previous year or years and then they use their judgment to make assumptions about what they think is going to happen in the future, right? We all do this every day. Uh, we look at the sales results from last year and say, what do we think is going to happen next year? We look at the number of open requirements that we uh, filled last year for talent acquisition, and we say, how many do we think we're going to do? Are we just going to go up by 10%? We don't know, right? We're trying to figure out really what's going to stay the same, what might go up, what might go down, and, and so on. But now to take that a step further, Businesses can really start applying statistical methods, right, to add precision to the analysis with models that really provide much greater accuracy because they're based on relevant patterns and, and proven theories about what's going to happen, right? So this is a fundamentally different way to look at our business and begin to plan for the future. So what makes predictive analytics different and just much more powerful than other types of data analysis is that we can really use it to identify complex patterns across big data sets that really uncover trends that we may not have seen before, right? Things that are just not obvious when we start to look at Excel spreadsheets and things like that, right? Because we're only maybe looking at one piece of the data. We're not looking at that overall trending. So you really start to see those trends that, you know, with your naked eye, they're not going to be real apparent. So in other words, by making use of technology, you don't have to wait for a person or a team or department to identify a pattern or kind of work out a theory, right? But it's really about what you can do for your organization based on this data in really new and, and different ways. So here's a common way of looking at it. <coughs> Excuse me. On the left side of this graph, you're going to see the most common type of analytics. These are really descriptive analytics, right? We see this all the time. This is the type of analytics or reporting is really what it is that tells you what's going well or what's going wrong in your organization, right? It's, it's very backward looking. You know, for example, we say all the time, well, our turnover is too high. 
Well, now almost every organization I talk with tells me their turnover is too high. Turnover is always too high, right? But high compared to what? Compared to last year's turnover or compared to an industry average or compared to some other metric maybe that you're looking at? Another problem is that knowing your overall turnover rate really can't tell you how to improve. It just tells you what it is, right? Or where to intervene or what's driving that turnover. This is the important stuff that we as HR professionals can then use to make an impact on the business. But when we're only looking at reporting, we're only looking at what is, not why it is and what we can do to impact it. So you really have to slice and dice and get much more sophisticated in the kind of analysis that you're doing in order to get the story behind those numbers, right? So moving into the middle uh, column here, you'll see really the, uh, kind of the second phase of analytics that we're talking about, which is really diagnostic analytics. And that starts to tell the story by identifying meaningful relationships and patterns within the data. So this is really a deeper dive that might tell you that, you know, say turnover is highest among your salespeople who fail to meet their quotas, right? Um, probably not a mind-blowing conclusion. I'm sure everybody who's ever, you know, worked with the sales force before has, has seen this. Um, you've all seen it play out. And you know from experience that, you know, probably failing to meet your quota or, or just sort of general poor performance, right, often leads to turnover. And that might be voluntary turnover. It might be involuntary turnover. You don't need really analytics to tell you that. But look at how we can apply that insight when we move over to the third column of predictive analytics. Because the idea here is really to predict ahead of time which candidates will struggle to meet quotas. And we know that will put them at higher risk of turnover, right? So if we can avoid that, avoid making those hires in the first place, that has a profound effect on that turnover rate, right? But that is really predicting the future. So you're not only able to impact performance and turnover in your organization, but you'll be able to predict the degree to which you'll really improve in those areas. And that's the difference, right? So you see how moving from my turnover rate is X to here is what a successful person looks like and here's what a successful person will do for my organization, one successful hire, will do for both a turnover rate and a performance improvement. So it's really about completely shifting your strategy to react from reactive to proactive. That's why predictive analytics has really become the gold standard in business intelligence, right? But businesses around the world are still working hard to adopt this, um, th this much more sophisticated approach. According to uh, Burson by Deloitte, who probably many of you on this call know, um, who's one of the leading uh, HR analyst uh, organizations uh, in the world, less than 10% of organizations, this is their own self-reporting, less than 10% of organizations really use predictive models in business and workforce planning. So we're only beginning to scratch the surface. So if you feel like you're behind in this area, um, you're not, right? but it does have this ability to really transform uh, your workforce, the way that you're operating as a business and really your role and career within, uh, within HR. So one of the things um, that makes predictive analytics so powerful is that its applications are, are, I mean, they're almost limitless, right? We've seen some pretty remarkable things from companies on the cutting edge of of predictive analytics. First example we'll talk about here is Walmart. I, I think probably everybody has heard of Walmart. That's probably a safe bet. Um, Walmart actually has has a state-of-the-art analytics hub that they call Data Cafe. Um, houses over 400 petabytes of recent transactional data. So when I was um, looking at this statistic, I actually had no idea what a petabyte actually was. Do you know what a petabyte is, Jason? It's a it lot is. of data. Yeah, it's it it's a huge it's a huge amount of data. So uh, let's see. I will I will test Jason here in the room. How many floppy disks does it take to hold one petabyte of data? What do you think? Uh, <clears throat> Ten thousand. Seven hundred and forty-five million. <laughs> 
<laughs> you were off. A lot of data. A little bit. <laughs> 745 million floppy disks to hold one petabyte of data. So this weekend when you're home with your families or at a cocktail party, there is your useless piece of information to, uh, to, to, to use. But it's pretty interesting. So uh, as another example, a three and a half year long full uh, HD video recording would be about one peta uh, petabyte of, of data in size. Three and a half year long. I don't know if I said hour long. Three and a half year long. So if you started recording a, a uh, um, an HD video today and you ended somewhere in 2021, that would be a petabyte of data. Wow. Um, so it's it's really powerful, right? And uh, this is actually Walmart is act, owns actually the world's largest private cloud. There's over 200 data streams coming in. These are things like weather data, economic data, Nielsen data, social media data, you name it. Um, it's being fed in. Walmart uses this data cafe to identify and solve really critical business problems. Like what happens if there's a sudden decline in sales in a store within minutes? Uh, they can see this where before, and, and they know how to solve this problem, where before these problems may have taken weeks or months to solve, right? So you really see how this impacts their business and their ability to make real-time decisions that really impact their sales, right? So it's not a coincidence if you live in Colorado like I do, where we're prone to May snowstorms every once in a while up in the mountains, then you walk into Walmart three days before and you see all of these shovels are back out again. And that's odd because the spring flower stuff was there, uh, you know, the day before and suddenly those shovels are out and then you see the forecasts for the weather, right? Not a coincidence that that's, ha that that's happening and they're using this big data and they're using predictive analytics to make those real-time decisions of where to send inventory. Um, the other example we want to talk about, another great example is Kroger. Now, you probably uh, know Kroger as well. They brought analytics completely in-house when it acquired an analytics firm in 2015. The analytics arm of the business applies predictive behavioral modeling to segment shoppers and then create individual experiences, right? Things like personalized promotions, tailored pricing for customers. These become the hallmark of Kroger's best-in-class loyalty program. And they've been an industry leader in this area for, for years. And having seen Kroger's success in same-store sales growth and, and market share gains, uh, you know, and then adding to that the rapid growth in the digital space, companies like Whole Foods um, are now following suit and partnering with anal analytics providers to stay more competitive. And, and there's no doubt with the acquisition of Amazon, you'll see Whole Foods uh, if not spring to the lead, certainly become competitive very quickly with Kroger. Um, Kroger's also pr proved its uh, its tech savvy capabilities by tackling the biggest complaint of customers, right? In any retail environment, everybody hates the checkout line, right? You, you, know, you finally make it out and then you're standing there in this endless uh, parade of people and try, just trying to get out of the store. Well, Kroger has used predictive analytics combined with their in-store technology and real-time data feeds to really ensure that customers never have more than one person ahead of them at the checkout, right? So they're able to apply this to provide a much better experience to their customer by being able to feed it into their labor predictive capabilities to know not only how many checkout counters we need to open, but how do we need to staff those so that there's never more than one person ahead of you in line. This is cut in their world. This has cut the average wait time for, from four minutes to 30 seconds. So just a huge, huge impact on, uh, on their business. Last example we'll, uh, we'll talk about here is Forbes uh, and Forbes Media, which is the media side of the magazine, which, which I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, they've also embraced predictive analytics as a way to reach the right prospect at exactly the right moment, right? So Forbes Media uses a, a predictive intelligence platform to identify prospects within their advertisers' markets. Then they deliver media to those prospects that's perfectly aligned with the buying stage and product interest. So this intelligence platform provides really super targeted and dynamic media programs, and then it unlocks a whole new level of ad optimization for Forbes, for Forbes clients, right? So suddenly... The system knows that you're moving from the research phase of buying a laptop 
for instance, into more of a buying phase based on the type of, of content that you're, uh, that you're reading, right? Because now maybe you've gone from how many, you know, petabytes of data do I need to store, should you need to store our data, into uh, the price, right? And then it will deliver an optimized experience rate to that consumer. So Forbes uh, Chief Revenue Officer, a fellow by the name of Mark Howard, says that this layer of analytics, of predictive analytics, provides a level of visibility into a target audience that had never before been accessible. So really, you know, as you can see through these examples, predictive analytics is revolutionizing these industries. And, and these are just a few, right, and countless others. And it's really empowered early adopters because that's really where we are with this. Remember we said that 10% feel like they're using this. We're very much in the early adopter stage. It's really empowered those early adopters to operate faster, smarter, and really stay ahead of their competition. So 10% of the world feels like they're doing this. I don't know of that 10%, how many feel like they're doing it well or just starting. So why is it important to be thinking about this now? Because predictive analytics is more accessible and widely used today thanks to advances in technology and the enormous amounts of data that we have at our fingertips. Right? One of the things we hear from customers all the time is, I don't know if I trust my, say, performance data. I don't know if I trust my, you know, whatever it is, right? <laughs> Hiring data but it's there. And when we can start to combine this with public sources of information, we have data at our fingertips that we've never had before. And big data has really enabled HR, which, you know, frankly, has really been a traditionally very much a soft skills industry to enter an era of predictive analytics and really kind of flex our analytical muscles for the first time ever, just like our peers have in finance and operations and marketing and sales and, and other departments of the organization. So to see how we've evolved into this really data-rich industry, let's look back for a second at the evolution of HR tech over, um, over, the, past, uh, over the past 30 years, right? If you've been in the HR space for a while, like, uh, like I have, um, then you've seen this firsthand. And it really, what has been an explosion of HR technology really began back in the 90s. And that was followed by waves of really rapid innovation, innovation and, and consolidation that, that has really largely continued, uh, continued today. The evolution of HR tech, um, of course, has really kind of mirrored the evolution of HR itself, right? Because as HR tech has evolved, we have had to evolve as HR professionals. And it, what it really does is reflects HR's major shift in strategy from really fundamentally a workflow kind of process or, you know, very process driven into really more about human performance and people focused. The first big wave of talent management came in the 90s. And HR tech up to that point was focused mainly on, you know, things that we were dealing with administrative and record keeping and payroll processing. But tech in the 90s, HR tech in the 90s really kickstarted a movement toward automation. We began to see, uh, we began to really free HR organizations from those administrative and like resource heavy tasks that we were dealing with um, that were really, you know, sort of fundamental to what talent management was at the time. Automation has really enabled huge gains in efficiency, but companies grew really tired quickly of managing products for seven or eight different vendors, right? So we had all this great new tech coming in. We were buying all these new things. And then we suddenly said, wait a second, none of this stuff is talking to each other. I've got, you know, eight different vendors for eight different pieces of stuff that I'm doing. I've got eight different logins. I don't really know where I'm going at any one given moment. And that's when integration really became essential. Today, automation and integration are, are really a given in HR technology, right? It's got to be there. They're the table stakes. But companies are much more concerned with things like employee engagement, teamwork, innovation, collaboration, culture. And they want HR tech solutions that are engaging and productivity oriented. You look at HR tech today and it has a very often a very consumer kind of look because ultimately that's whether we're talking about our employees or our candidates, it's a very consumer 
oriented model, right? So integrated talent management is really still important, but the real focus is on inventing the way people work. You know, things like team-based hubs for collaborating and coaching. Things like always on uh, pulse surveys and feedback systems and tools that really empower individual learning and career go growth, but on a real time basis, as opposed to, you know, when we used to sit down with our manager once a year and have the dreaded, um, you know, appraisal conversation, right? Um, so all that to say, there's really, there's no lack of demand for HR systems and tools in, a, in the HR space today, which means access uh, to data is gonna continue to grow. This is not slowing down especially when you consider the recent shifts in performance management, right? From, like I said, that you know, dreaded annual conversation uh, into what we have now, which are really almost continuous streams of pulse and engagement and performance data uh, that are coming in. The, the challenge is, how do we make meaning of this? And how do we use this data, right? So the HR tech market is expected to grow 10% annually through about 2020, which is great, you know, if you're in our business or or others, and it's great for you as consumers of these products. Um, and, and that's according to Gartner, by the way. Um, but this growth is going to continue to produce more and more data and consolidating that data, leveraging it to forecast the future rather than have it just reflect on the past like we've always done. That is the crucial next step that we as HR professionals really need to begin to bring into our business and lead the way for our businesses. And that's where predictive analytics really come into play. So this represents a huge untapped opportunity for you, right? For you in HR, for the HR industry in general. By embracing predictive analytics, you're going to uncover patterns and relationships across your workforce that you've never seen before. This stuff has never been clear, right, as we've tried to make these decisions, but you will be able to see it for the first time. And finally, you're going to be able to quantify your impact on business performance and the bottom line of your company. For years, we've been hearing about HR having a seat at the table. This is where it happens, and this is what enables it to happen. It's really being able to quantify that impact that you as an HR professional are having on not only the bottom line, right? Yeah, a reduced turnover, you know, five points or 10 points, that's great. What have you done for sales? What have you done to drive revenue? And this is where you're going to be able to quantify that performance. But before we can really embrace uh, predictive analytics in HR, there's, there's really there's two things that we need to be thinking about we need to overcome uh, in, uh, in our world today, right? First, unlike our friends in finance or operations or probably, uh, probably marketing, um, HR professionals typically aren't trained as data analysts. I, I I would, I would probably guess that the vast, vast, vast majority of you on this call today who are HR professionals um, did not get into the space to grind data. That is probably not why you did this. This is probably a choice you made because you enjoy working with people. You enjoy that social aspect of it. You enjoy helping. You enjoy driving performance, uh, you know, getting more performance out of those individuals, right? These are really critical things, but we're probably not often trained as data analysts, right? So to fill the skills gap, at least until we bulk up on our analytical expertise, organizations have to hire teams that know how to understand, know how to apply, and know how to use predictive analytics effectively. And then secondly, um, too often, HR is really disconnected from other parts of the business. Um, and this often includes finance and sales, right? So in some organizations, talent acquisition isn't even connected to talent management, right? Which, which means that pre-hired data, things like uh, candidate assessment scores and uh, interview rankings and, you know, stuff like that, it's not connected to post-hire outcomes, things like engagement and performance. We don't know if what we're doing in talent acquisition is actually driving performance because we're not given access to that data. That's a problem. Those silos have to break down within HR to start to be able to use this data effectively. You've got to be able to partner more closely with other business units so that you can really consolidate, capture that data, and then consolidate that data for really, truly predictive results. 
But overcoming these barriers, these are not insurmountable, right? And any time that technology drives change in, a, in an organization, you have barriers like this. And overcoming those barriers is not insurmountable, and it's worth 100% of the effort. Because predictive analytics is going to drive superior decision-making. It's going to change the way you make decisions. And it's going to support the type of strategic visioning and problem-solving that C-suite leaders in your organization are beginning to expect from HR. That's not going to change. So here are a few of the questions uh, you're going to really um, be able to answer and take on using, uh, using predictive analytics. So we're going to go back to turnover again for a second. Turnover, I'm sure it's something that uh, most of you are you're measuring it already, right? With basic reporting, you'll be able to see and you're tracking your current turnover rate. But using predictive analytics, you'll know what turnover will look like next year based on things like market trends, employee engagement scores, labor market trends, other factors to really be able to understand what's going to happen down the line and how do we plan as a business for that. So then using that knowledge, you're going to be able to develop a retention index or a risk index and implement preventative solutions that are going to help you retain your top performers. Avoid hiring new employees who will be at high risk of turning over, right, to further impact and intervene in the future on those turnover rates, right? And that's really where you see the big ROI coming out of efforts like this. Another great example is cost per hire. I talk to HR organizations about this all the time. So basic reporting, they, it can tell you what your average cost per hire is. We probably you know, have a general sense. All of us have a general sense of that. But after hiring for a given amount of time, predictive analytics will really tell you what your cost per hire will be when you start to consider factors like the low unemployment world that we live in right now, right? Again, it's looking at the future. You can break this metric down further to find out the expected daily cost to the business to then source and fill jobs. And most importantly, what is the lost opportunity cost by waiting, right? Which is often significantly more than anything else we're looking at. So these things become very real numbers that we can then use to help run our business. So knowing that will not only provide you with a time to fill estimate for future vacancies, but it's also going to help build your business case for investments in other solutions that are going to help improve hiring efficiency as well as retaining your people, right? This is one of the biggest business challenges, one of the biggest challenges that we see today. It's how do we use data to build a business case for investments that we want to make, right? This, again, helps when we're talking about predictive analytics, it really is about predicting the future, and then using that data to build a business case to further those, uh, those investments that we can make. Last example is really around employee performance. Performance rankings and uh, ratings and other metrics depend, I mean, obviously, depend highly on the quality of those metrics, right? Um, but they can tell you who your top performers are. But predictive analytics takes that a step further, and it's going to help you maximize the performance among those employees and fill roles in your organization with more top performers, right? It's about not only understanding who are your top performers, right, based on the performance data, but how do you use that data blended in with other things like assessment data and, and things like that to really understand, okay, using this, now that I understand what a top performer is, how do I use that to fill roles across the organization with more of those top performers? And then knowing what drives your top performers to succeed is going to give you an edge in future selection and development. Those analytics can be leveraged through predictive assessments, uh, for instance, to identify candidates who will perform better on the job and ultimately identify opportunities for improvement uh, in your current hires that will most impact the performance on their organization. So those are just some of the questions you're going to be able to answer using predictive analytics, right, within HR. So now let's look at how this might actually play out in your organization. Because we're not all Kroger, we're not all Walmart, Walmart right? And these, these are big organizations, and not everybody on this call is in a huge organization. But it doesn't mean you can't 
<clears throat> take a step in this area. First, how do we implement predictive analytics into your talent strategy? And then how do we quantify the hard dollar impact of the gains that you've achieved through using predictive analytics? So let's look um, at a predictive selection process, for example. Many of our clients use predictive analytics in this way, right? And what they see are significant improvements in employee performance metrics and company performance overall. In the talent acquisition world, every hiring decision we make has a value. Sorry, slipping around uh, my slides here. So um, every hiring decision has a value and good hires are those who go on to become top performers. While bad hires don't fit, term early, they quit, they never really reach full productivity, or worse, they stay, <laughs> but they still never reach full productivity, right? Um, call them the walking dead. Um, good hires are good and bad hires are bad, right? We know that, blinding glimpse of the obvious there, but how good and how bad? How much are those hiring decisions contributing to or costing your company? That's the real question. We know based on research we've conducted on thousands of job candidates across industries, there are certain behavioral traits that lead to success in certain jobs. And they can be strong predictors of job performance. So by looking at those behavioral traits across your incumbents in those jobs, you can really begin to see what sets your top performers apart. So in this example, top performers are in blue and poor performers are in gray. And when we look at this range on, for example, the first one on cautious thinking, right? So behavioral trait um, of cautious thinking. What we see is that it really doesn't differentiate much um, performance in, in this particular role, right? Do you notice on cautious thinking, kind of our top performers and, and poor performers are all kind of clumped together there. But when we look down on the sociability scale, another behavioral trait, um, we start to see how we start to see a much different spread, right? We start to see our top performers are fairly clustered together toward the extroverted side. Our poor performers are really kind of, you know, either kind of across the board or, or you know, tending to a cluster together on the introverted side. This becomes a better predictor of success. Again, this is one trait, right? These are two traits, I guess. Um, so this is just a, a, a sample of what we look at, what we may look at within one overall predictive algorithm. You have you know, much many more uh, traits in this and behaviors, but again, it gives you a good idea of when you start to use predictive data measured against your top performers and bottom performers and look at that clustering on both scales, you start to see some things that we may believe are really key drivers of success are really kind of, yeah, our top performers all possess them, but so do our bottom performers. Doesn't tell us much. When we start to look at other scales, we see our top performers start to form a pattern. Our bottom performers are either kind of everywhere or form a pattern. That really becomes a predictive characteristic, right? And we wanna be able to relay that um, into the way that we make hiring decisions. This is a really simple way of looking at it and saying, how do we use predictive data um, in the uh, in the hiring process. So once we know what leads to success in that role, right? Once we understand what makes top performers top performers, bottom performers bottom performers, and and what really separates them, we can then focus your hiring efforts. You can focus your hiring efforts on people who are most likely to be your top performers, right? I mean, kind of makes sense. So at one of our insurance clients, large insurance uh, agency we work with. We found that strong sales reps sell or, uh, or, uh, or, or reps who scored well on predictive assessment sold $84,000 more in their first year than poor sales reps, right? Really meaningful difference on individual performance that we saw there. So if they're scoring well on the predictive assessment, uh, they were selling $84,000 more in their first year than somebody who didn't score well, right? So fairly simple, but a really meaningful impact on individual performance. One of our uh, large retail clients, uh, uh, 
very well-known convenience store chain saw very similar results. So they looked across their franchisee population, right? So they, so they were looking at franchisees who actually um, bought businesses with them, uh, bought convenience stores, and found that strong franchise owners, those owners who scored well on the predictive assessment, actually drove $6,000 more in sales each month. So 72000 more than poor franchise owner. Now, we'll tell you in a minute why all of this matters, right? Because $6,000, again, $72,000 a year, still a meaningful difference, right? But we'll get to that in a second when you start to compound this. And this is where really rubber meets the road, right? So knowing what those performance differences mean in terms of financial impact, you then can multiply these numbers out over your expected number of hires to see the total potential impact that a, pre a truly predictive selection process will have on your bottom line, right? So those numbers, that $6,000 number and that uh, $84,000 number, I mean, certainly they're good numbers, right? All of us would love to have $6,000 or certainly $84,000 more in their pocket today. But when you start when you look at, say, our insurance client, for instance, and you start to use predictive analytics to compare the hiring of top performing sales reps over their total population, it meant a total impact of $16.8 million in the coming year. That's what that adds up to, right? Because these, these, this effect compounds over the number of hires. Those, are, those numbers I gave you before are one hire. So that insurance company, $16.8 million. For the convenience store client I mentioned, again, using predictive analytics to select top performing franchisees, well, that $6,000 a month or $72,000 a year impact on an individual franchise means $23.4 million across the organization. This is why I said our role as HR professionals are changing, right? It's really, it's not only about reducing turnover. The turnover rates associated with this on the, say, the sales position, the impact that we're driving there pales in comparison to that $16.8 million that we're driving in top-line performance, right? With results like this, you're not going to have any problem justifying an investment in predictive analytics in your organization. These numbers are profound, and this is where our role is changing and, and being able to use this data to really not make better predictive decisions for our organization, make better hires, develop people in a much more targeted way, understand the impact from that, drive that back into the top and bottom line performance. This is how we truly get a seat at the table. This is how we drive impact for the overall organizations. So, you know, to wrap it up, if predictive analytics was once beyond the scope of HR, that's not the case anymore. An analytical mindset is critical to our role in HR today, just like it is in finance, in operations, in marketing, and, and countless other industries. Predictive analytics it represents the cutting edge of data analysis and, and the business intelligence we use every day to, to make decisions. According to Burson, by the way, I mentioned before, now is the time to get serious and double down on your investments in this area. Companies that don't are, are going to be disrupted by companies that do. Remember, I said 10% feel like they're using predictive analytics to make decisions in their workforce today. If you can be one of those 10%, you are ahead of the 90, right? And that's the key here. What we're able to do then is really because we're able to recruit, because we're able to understand this data, we're able to recruit our competitors' people, right? We're able to supercharge our sales forces and we're able to, to really drive top and bottom line results like we've never been able to do before. So with that, uh, start to take uh, some questions here. I know that uh, that have been uh, coming in as we've gone. Jason, I don't know if you've got. Uh... I do. Thanks. Uh, I do. I have some some questions. So first of all, I just want to thank people for for asking questions. You know, sometimes you do this and no questions come through. But I really appreciate the uh, the interest and the and the back and forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, 
the first thing I just want to address with everybody is we will be posting this webinar to Outmatch.com within 24 hours. Um, you can email uh, Charles directly or email me for slides specifically, so that that's no problem to share that kind of stuff. And uh, just one thing, too, yep. just before we get into questions, if anybody does drop off early, there is going to be a survey at the end. We just ask you to take a second and just fill that out before you. Uh, when you close your window, it should pop up. So yeah. just a quick reminder. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. It's a short survey, so just a little bit of information from you. Um, all right. It's a petabyte of data. That's right. Just a petabyte. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions came through that I think are in certainly interesting in your role as a CEO. So one of the questions was around, I'm already providing the data that I was asked to provide. <laughs> and and it's I feel like it's more reactive than proactive, like you were talking mm -hmm. about. So how how do the, the question really is around how do I manage that? Okay, I'm going to give you different data, but it's actually better. Mm -hmm. How do how do HR how does HR manage that process? Like, listen, Greg, I'm not going to get you what you asked for. I'm going to get you something different, and yeah. here's why that's better. Yeah, here, here's what I would say: um, experiment, right? You know, we I'm going to use the example of uh, of turnover just because it's a really easy uh, it's an easy example. Um, I I'm I'm not saying that say uh, knowing your turnover rate is not important. It is, right? So if you're being asked to report on your turnover rate, you should report on your turnover rate, right? <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't start to experiment with other data. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't um, start to combine that with other data. So you are still reporting on that data that you're being asked to report for, uh, report on, but being able to pull in, say, assessment data, looking at uh, turnover data, right? This is a mindset change. Oftentimes, we're being asked to report on these things that may be very reactive data because that's all our executives are used to seeing from us, right? So that, that mindset will change once the data that you're showing them becomes more valuable. So what I would say is show them that data that you're being asked, uh, that you're being asked to report on, but start to look at those patterns, start to pull in, say, assessment data, start to pull in other form, you know, look, start to look back on those trends around, say, labor market, right? Things that are readily accessible by any organization, regardless of size. Start to put it together, look for those patterns, patterns yourself, right? And maybe once those patterns start to emerge, start to show that data with the reporting that you're being asked. And I guarantee you the conversation fundamentally changes, right? So often, um, we're being asked for stuff because that's what we're used to seeing. Until we lead, right, that conversation, yep. that's where it starts to change. Right. So while you were giving that answer, someone had a question which was, um, you know, I feel like I'm just getting the basics right, so where do I get started? And there's a there's another one related to that that I, that I want to ask. So it's, it's okay, so... So keep giving what I'm giving and add some value to what I'm giving, right? Absolutely. That's essentially what you just said. Absolutely. So where where do we go? Where does someone go to get the data? This is another question from here. Where do I be? Where do I go to start getting the kind of data that is the right kind of data for predictive analysis, or the right kind of data that that is more proactive than reactive? Well, how do I start that process? Because I, I don't know where to go. Right. First, understand what drives your business. Right. Um, I had a, um, I had a, uh, you know, we have conversations all the time that just kind of sometimes shock me, right? <laughs> How disconnected things can get um, from uh, from the the critical factors that really drive our business, right? A any industry, any business relies on on a few key metrics. That's it, right? So you know, you look at retail, um, same store sales, uh, intent to return. Uh, customer satisfaction, right? These are these are metrics across any industry. The first step that if you're just kind of getting started in this space, in this area, the first thing that you need to do is understand what's driving your business performance. What metrics matter to your CEO? What are they, re if you're publicly traded, what are they reporting to Wall Street? If you're not publicly traded, what are they reporting to their board? What are those two, three, four key metrics that are, that they care about? Then, be able to start to look at that, right? So let's just use same store sales or let's use actually intent to return, right? Because it's a good one. One of our large restaurant clients, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of locations, um, were able to combine assessment scores, changes in assessment scores, right? 
as a proxy of hiring and then looked at intent to return scores. So if you're not in the restaurant space, intent to return is basically exactly what it sounds like. Uh, a diner leaves your restaurant and you say, how likely, Jason, are you uh, to return, right? That's intent to return, really important metric. Start to look at that, just take that one simple metric and then start to look at that and, to, and compare that to your turnover rates. If your turnover rates fall, what happens to intent to return? Does it go up, right? How about average check size? Again, another restaurant metric, right? Your turnover rates fall, what happens to average check size? Just looking at the data, right? It's, it's being able to take those just a few simple metrics to start with. You don't have to be Walmart. You don't have to have 200 data streams, right, to do this. Um, but it's understanding what drives your business and then comparing it to the data that you're working with every day, right? Things like turnover, selection, performance, right? Those are the kind of the key ingredients with yeah. an HR organization. Compare that to your business metrics. Start there. Got it. Yeah. And one, one thing I was thinking of when you were talking is one thing that we've done at Outmatch, and it's not just with the HR team, it's with, it's with all the teams. We identified uh, someone in the, in the company who was just an excellent analyst, mm -hmm. right? So none of you on the phone know Micah, but we're talking about <laughs> Micah. Um, when anybody has a, a particularly sticky analytical problem or has a bunch of data that they just need some insight on, you know, we found that Micah is a great analyst. And, and I know that Micahs exist in your companies, those of you listening on the phone, Micahs exist in your companies too. And that's another way I think to get started is to say, well, we know this, we, we know intent to return and, and I, I think turnover might be related. How there's somebody in the business who can, who's that type of analytical mind who can help you do that if that's not you. Cause that's, that's not me. So, so I need, I need someone like Mike. That's right. That. All those business results exist within finance, right? Talk to your CFO. I mean, that's all that stuff is living there. Talk to that, talk to your CFO about, you know, understanding why you want to look at say sales results compared to, Turnover rates or oh. whatever it is, right? And then there was a, a question here um, about culture fit versus performance. So how those two things ah. are rated because that are, are related. There was in the beginning we were talking about job performance, how it's related to business performance, but is there a relationship with culture? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite recent topics. <laughs> um, so we just actually acquired a culture uh, and engagement company here at Outmatch. Culture. Not a planted question, by the way. It actually was asked in the, <laughs> yeah. in the thing. So, yeah. Um, so um, we acquired a company called Pomelo, P-O-M-E-L-L-O, -L -L -O, like the Asian fruit, which, of course, yes. is a reference that you'll all, that you'll all know. Um, so, uh, so Pomelo is, um, uh, in addition to being a good fruit, um, measures culture and engagement. And one of the things that um, – that we talk about all the time is culture fit drives job engagement, job engagement drives performance, right? It's kind of this loop, right? So the more somebody fits our culture and we can understand that first, the first step is understanding what our culture is, right? And there's real, there's culture analysts. We talk about cultural DNA all the time, right? With, within the Pomelo business, there are real culture analytics um, that we can collect. The first analytic that we can collect around culture is figuring out what our culture even is, right? I'm the CEO of Outmatch. We're not that big. I mean, we've got about 100 people. But I can tell you right now what I think our culture is is completely different from what many people think our culture is here, right? Because I view it as an aspirational culture. I always view it through the lens of what I want it to be. While we have a fantastic culture here, it is different, right? What I view is different than what, what many others. So it's first baselining what is our culture today that makes people successful. And then once we understand that, we can then measure candidates and, uh, and incumbents and, and, our, and our current employees to understand the differences between departments and what's making those departments stick, right? That's all a form of analytics then we can measure the ongoing engagement against those analytics, right? So when we understand what the culture is, we can measure current cultural fit against that, uh, that culture and then continue to measure the ongoing engagement because it's that engagement that will drive performance. There's a great article. For, if you're interested in this uh, topic at all, and this has nothing to do with Pomelo, um, uh, there was a great uh, article in this month's Harvard Business Review 
uh, called, I think it's called like the culture factor or something like that is the title. It's on the cover of the <laughs> Harvard Business yeah. Review. Like, I think it's December's actually. I said this month, but it might be December. Anyway, great article. Um, that really quantifies the impact that culture and engagement have on the performance of an organization. So if you're if you're interested in this topic, we have nothing to do with this whatsoever, but but check it out um, and read it. Cool. Um, two other questions that I wanted to cover. There was one that was um, big data, predictive analytics seems like the domain of an enterprise size company. Is this something something that smaller companies can take advantage of as well? And, and what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't even think of this as big data. Right. I mean, it is in Walmart's world. Um, it is in Kroger's world. But don't don't worry about this as big data, um, because that just carries too many like connotations to it that one are scary and two are big and expensive and hairy and everything else. Right. Just just think about this as looking beyond your current data set. Right. Just think about it as saying, OK, if I'm report again, I keep using turnover because it's something we all live in. If I'm reporting on turnover, what can I combine that data with? Can I combine it with performance information, right? So can I understand perform what performance looks like in our, it, this is the world we live in every day in the assessment world, right? Here's a way to start. Total uh, plug here, but right? here's the way you could start. Use an assessment for hiring, right? Because what that's going to do for you is it's, you're gonna be able to, we're gonna be able to take performance information, help somebody understand exactly what makes a top performer, a top performer, and what separates them from bottom performers, and then be able to use that to predict better performance of hires and quantify, right? That's performance analytics. That's really what we're talking about. It's, it's not big data. It doesn't need to be. Right. I mean, it is the big data if you're outmatched and you're running 20 million candidates a year, but you can leverage that data for your own little data. But you're being able to apply that rapidly to make better hiring decisions. That is really what predictive analytics um, is all about, right? It's just, it's, it's combining data sets. In that case, we're combining candidate data with, perform with performance data of our incumbents and understanding where it overlaps and how that maps to future performance. Cool. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right, we've we've come to uh, we've come to an hour, so I don't want to keep you longer than an hour. I first just want to thank you all for for being on the phone, uh, asking questions. It's really great to to do these types of presentations. So thank you so much for for your attention and more importantly for your time. So um, next month we are going to kick off a, a webinar series. It's a three part series, and the first part of that series will be will be next month. It's really all about hiring success, and we'll talk about sourcing, screening, and, stra and strategy for, for sourcing and screening. So that'll be, the, uh, that'll be next month's webinar. Please look for that. We'll be sending out invitations and, and uh, times to mark your calendars for that. Also, when- that, then that one's around culture. So those and questions that we're getting around culture. That's right. Culture, that's right. That. Perfectly, perfectly attuned right into culture. So thank you for that. And uh, remember, when you leave the GoToWebinar application, there will be a small poll for you to fill out. If you would fill that out, it gives us some great information about how to tailor these um, in the future. So on behalf of Greg Moran and myself, Jason Ferrara, 